Hello there and welcome to Complete Games. I'm James and this is the Explorer Note read through for Santiago on Extinction. We were first introduced to the character of Santiago back on Aberration, and although he didn't have his own dedicated note series, he did appear in Mei Ying, Diana and Elena's notes. We know that he's a tech nerd from the future and he was a member of the Federation Armed Forces. He's also the character that was responsible for the Gateway Project. Before we jump into this though, I just want to talk about the announcement trailer that we got for ARC 2 back in early December of 2020. It was of course confirmed that Vin Diesel will be playing the character Santiago in a new game due out in late 2022. I know this was met at the time with mixed views, but since then Wildcard has put out a press release and explains that Vin Diesel has joined the team as an executive producer, not only for ARC 2, but for the animated series as well. But he's also earned himself the title of President of Creative Convergence, whatever that may mean. But I do remember Vin Diesel many years ago pointing out to a reporter when asked whether he was PlayStation or Xbox, and he replied that he was a PC gamer who spent a lot of time playing Ark Survival Evolved. So it would appear that the decision to bring on board a celebrity face for a computer game goes a little bit deeper and Vin Diesel himself has clearly got his own interest in the animated series doing well. When we look at the list of celebrities involved, I for one am looking forward to the new animated TV show. It's set to comprise of 14 half hour episodes and will be an original story for the art franchise. Vin Diesel himself is said to have had a hand in the development of the story for both the game and the new animated series and clearly his appointment as executive producer has brought a whole host of talent to the project. So if it all goes horribly wrong and the show ends up being a disaster, well we can blame Vin Diesel. I'm a wheel man. And on that bombshell, sit back, relax and enjoy part one of the notes from Santiago on Extinction. I wish everyone would just shut up for five seconds. I already know this is bad. We all do. So just keep your hyperventilating to yourself, all right? Jesus. When we stepped through my gateway and teleported to the surface, we thought we escaped the worst of it, but it turns out that this planet is a burnt out post-apocalyptic nightmare. Some people feel like we're back to square one, but objectively we're not. We've got tech equipment, supplies, some tamed animals and a decent number of human assets. All I need is for people to give me some space and let me think. This is just another code that needs cracking. I think we found a decent spot to set up shop. That crater up ahead should have everything we need. Mei Ying scouted it out with some of her pets, so that's at least one person who isn't panicking. Not that I expected her to after she took the suicide out of that suicide mission back on the station. Dai really knew how to pick a winner. While we travel, I've been putting together some equipment. Nothing too complicated, just some basic gear to help me take a few measurements of our environment. Gravity, soil composition, atmosphere, etc. I've got a good idea of what they'll tell me, but it's worth confirming. Some of my readings were outside of my estimates, but this is definitely Earth. That same old self-absorbed ball of dirt. I figured as much. According to that biologist Helena, people from my time are the most advanced humans on those stations. That means that they couldn't have been built too far into the future. And last I knew, the Federation and the URE was still stuck on Earth. It wasn't for lack of technology, just the usual suspects, politicians. They could barely share one planet, much less space. People like to talk about having AI overlords as a nightmare scenario, but if we were ruled by machines, I might be looking at a flourishing Martian landscape instead of this ravaged one on Earth. Doesn't sound all that bad when you think about it. I mean, look at what happened with humans in charge. Construction on Camp Omega is going well. Things usually do when I have a project to focus on. I prefer something more challenging than living quarters, stables and basic defences, but this keeps me busy for now. I'm the de facto leader of this outfit these days. I realise that. No one else still among the living is qualified, so fine. I'll do the job. I just can't stand being bothered with every little disagreement or emotional breakdown. I've got real work to do, solving real problems. That's why I made the Federation set me up in that mountain villa as part of my contract. My little hideaway. With just me and whatever puzzle they needed me to solve. It was perfect. Had a great sound system too. Assuming my memories are real anyway. Tried chatting with Elena a little today about this Earth situation. Smart girl. Probably smarter than anyone else here I've met, but I think she has a hard time telling when I'm messing with her and when I'm just being a jerk. Not her fault, 
There's a reason why the Federation suits only visited me when they absolutely had to. Didn't matter how high ranking they were. I'd never mince my words with any of them. I knew they'd have to take it. They needed me. So yeah, I can be a pain to deal with. Unless you're awesome like Di. She may not have been an engineer or a scientist, but she had a PhD in talking shit. Miss that ginger lunatic. Camp Omega's basically up and running, complete with functional infrastructure, and we've got resources to spare, lots of them. The surface of this planet is brimming with element. After just a couple of expeditions to the edge of the wastes, we've practically filled our storehouses. I'm not sure what we're going to do with it all. I'm not sure how there's so much of it. Element wasn't nearly this common in our time. Granted, all the element that those stations are made of had to come from somewhere, so theoretically this city could have been built on top of an undiscovered vein. This much of it would turn even the smallest village into a metropolis overnight. But if that's what's happened here, then where's the mine? May need to take a few more readings. I ran the numbers. We're living in a scientific impossibility. Elements simply couldn't expand fast enough to reach this level of density under natural conditions, even with a millennia of uninterrupted growth. That means something accelerated it at an alarming rate, even if this area's readings are an outlier. Well, I say something, but there's an obvious answer here. Man. Any tech that runs on element emits a few molecules of it back into the atmosphere, which takes root in the soil. It's kind of like pollination, but the scale's so small and we consume it so fast that it's practically negligible. To spread it in any significant degree, you'd need a huge spike in element proliferation. A spike you'd get from, say, a century of open warfare with element-based weaponry. And the best of that weaponry, that'd be mine. Sure, there's a chance it wasn't weapons. The civilian applications for elements were spreading daily after all. I would know. I took a few corporate espionage gigs under the table just to see if I could. If they started cutting enough corners on filtration, no. I have to face the implications here. Not that I was a paragon of virtue. I knew I was engineering pre-packaged death, but it should never have gone this far. Then again, if I'm just a clone of an original Santiago, am I really responsible? I keep saying me and I, but it's not my fault that I have these memories. Although, if I accept that, what's left of me? Either I'm a horseman of the apocalypse, or I'm nothing at all. Deal with this later. There's work to do. The situation's changed on us yet again. We saw some big monsters in those caves, but those guys we spotted a few hours ago dwarf all of them. It's not even close. Add the mechanicalized drones we've been dealing with, and all of a sudden, our firepower seems pretty underwhelming. I wonder if those behemoths are a result of the element mutation. Depending on how you look at it, that would make them my problem in more ways than one. Fine then. If they're a problem, I'll just make a solution same as always. And I won't do it by dismissing my identity. I'll lean into it. Yeah, I've got just the thing. It's interesting how the worst circumstances are always the catalyst for my best ideas. Giant bipedal battle mechs. When I told everyone that was my big idea, I'm not sure what I got more of. Blank stares or nervous laughter. I think the ones that were laughing hoped I would join in. I didn't. Hey, I get it. I know how it sounds. It's just like I said though, if I'm going to accept my identity as Santiago, then I may as well lean into it. If the original me really engineered Armageddon into reality with crazy high-tech weaponry, then I'm going to reverse it with an even crazier high-tech weapon. Some people may call that fighting fire with fire, but I call it fighting a small gun with a much bigger gun. Turns out no one else had a better plan, so the wheels are in motion. I've already got teams working on hangars and gathering resources while I hammer out the schematics. Building these mechs are going to be one of the hardest things I've ever done. Maybe the hardest. With the gateway project, I could use the obelisks as a blueprint, but these are all me. Luckily, having an eidetic memory means I can call on everything I ever studied about robotics, so I'm not starting from scratch. Besides, this is my true love. They say consistently crunching away on a big project will make anyone burn out. But for me, it feels more like a dip in a Lazarus pit. I live for the grind. The final mech designs are complete. Based on the skills and experience of our potential pilots, I've decided to emphasize the energy sword as its primary weapon and divert a bit less power to the precision tech cannon. That's just the base model though. 
Each mech has a modification slot where equipment can be swapped to suit the pilot's tendencies and mission parameters. There's a reactive shield dome to protect the team in force close quarters combat, an artillery cannon for the backline support, and shoulder mounted missile launches for when you just say, to hell with this thing in particular. That alone would make them worth the effort, but I haven't even gotten to the best part. I designed these mechs to make the most of our resources, so while alone they're devastating fighting machines, together they're more than the sum of their parts. I mean that literally. We have the resources to make four of them, but when they're all in close proximity, they can fuse into one even more powerful mech, the Mega Mech if you will. I got the idea when I was messing with the teleportation tech we found on those hunter-killer robots that roam the city. Instead of physically linking the mechs together like puzzle pieces, I combine them on an atomic level via teleportation. It's my masterpiece, the ultimate fighting machine, with the most efficient element reactor and most powerful energy sword ever created. None of those monsters will stand a chance against it, no matter how big, as long as we can find some pilots that can handle it, that is. The number of assets we have with any piloting experience at all is practically nil, so I focused on making the controls as accessible as possible. I landed on a combination of Neuralink and gyroscopic full body motion sensors for what I call beta level piloting. Basically, once you've linked up, the mech will mimic the pilot's movements and an automated system will handle the messy details. But because I just can't help myself, I also added an array of hard light consoles and a stronger connection to the nervous system for alpha level piloting. That'll offer refined control over every bit of the mech, but it would take a stud pilot like Dai to utilise it. I couldn't possibly build a machine without leaving a way for it to reach its full potential though, even if no one here can unleash it. Mech pilot evaluation, candidate 004, Li Mei Ying. I admit, when I decided to go with simplified controls that mimic the movements of the pilot, I had Mei Ying in mind. This isn't about pity or nepotism either, She's objectively the best close quarters fighter we have, and based on our interview, no one's as battle hardened. She answered both tactical and moral dilemmas quickly and decisively. The latter's a little scary, but we need a pilot like that. Someone who won't hesitate when the safety of the group is on the line. The only question is her emotional state. I don't know what stage of grief she's supposed to be in, but when the fight starts, there's a chance she loops right back to anger. Still, even with her blood running a little hot, she's clearly a top candidate. And that concludes part one of the note read through for Santiago on Extinction. We will be back this time tomorrow night with part two. And I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you to everybody who's taken the time to comment on my videos over the last week. I have been playing a new game, Valheim, for anybody who's interested in a new survival game. I'm really quite enjoying that one. Check that one out at the moment. But uh, I've put out a few consecutive videos over this week and there's been quite a lot of comments that have come in and I'm sorry that I haven't been able to reply to quite a few of them. I am going to catch up and know that the comments are why I continue to do this and you guys really do keep me motivated and uh, I'm very grateful for them. So. Uh, I will take the time to, of course, reply to as many of you as I can, so sorry if I'm a little bit late in my response. But until next time, I'm James from Complete Games, and I'll see you.